We're going to look at our last uh, direction field example. <coughs> so this y prime will be 2 y minus 1 over x. And of course, when x is 0, this won't work. So we'll go with 0 if x is 0, and the one above if x is not 0. <coughs> so we'll do the same negative 2 to 2, negative 2 to 2 on the x and the y. So graph 25. Uh, slope points. And it's gonna, obviously it's a different flow than what we got last time. You should not get a circle flow, but this is what we're doing. So I'm graphing my x equals 0 ones first because all those slopes are 0. So that was, in my opinion, the easiest one to graph. The other easy horizontal slope is when y equals 1. <coughs> you also get horizontal or flat slopes. After this, I have to start thinking. What about when y equals negative one? Negative one. Well, it depends. Still, then it depends on what x is. So I gotta. I basically have to figure the rest out. I think individually. At some point, you may see a pattern happen, especially like in the lower left corner. There's probably gonna be a more obvious pattern. Like the upper right, there's only two points, so you need three points to establish a pattern. So I'm just gonna compute both of them by hand. Won't be able to use a pattern. So I'm basically just plugging in values and seeing what I get. I mean, I could plug in like 6, 4 if I wanted to, but I'm plugging in <coughs> values between negative 2 and 2 for x and y. So I'm just going kind of one at a time and finding them out.
something's going wrong. What I wanted my flow lines to look like was something like this. You put in uh, zero instead of one in your uh, thing two zero. Like it should be uh, two times zero minus one. Thing. Ooh. So that gives us positive one. Positive one, and then I'll get positive two out of this other. Oh, I know how to fix it. All right, I wrote the original one down wrong. I'm going to go with infinity if x equals 0. That'll fix it. So <clears throat> it's OK. What does infinity slope mean? It means vertical. So we can deal with infinity slope. I'll just redraw the axes. So we're going to get a vertical slope on the <coughs> y-axis, which of course is pretty much impossible to see. So we've changed the second equation? No, that's not what I want. Let's just graph the what I, what I had before. This won't have a nice solution. That's okay. And then you have to change the there. Yeah, it just won't have a nice flow basically at the end. But it will still be true. Right? It's a bad. Yeah, it's a. It, it'll be the direction field for this differential equation. The problem is this differential equation won't have a nice solution because there's going to be a lot of problems. So if you drop leaves in, they're not going to flow smoothly through. It should be pretty clear that that why can that not be a flow line or a curve? Because it should have one thing going. Right there. This one would be like a parabola, though. Like when that kind of go down and then hit that and go back up. Yeah, it looks like or yeah, it looks like it should be doing things like this, but the problem is our flat slope right there messes this up basically. Well why couldn't it go like an upside down parabola like up to the horizontal line and then back down? Oh like this? Yeah. Um Oh. Because the slope gets steeper the closer you get to the y axis. Actually I let's see. Let's just finish this off on the bottom. So we should have that shape, and then I'll do I'll do the very bottom, the uh, y equals negative two.
So that's what your slope field should look like. Now generally, unless your uh, differential equation, your y prime is really ugly, it should form some type of a pattern. It may not be obvious, but there should be, like for example, if you kind of look as we move up here, there is a pattern going on. Right? They're getting uh, basically more positive as you move up, or, or I should say more <coughs> negative as you move up, but there's kind of a pattern you can see. Now with this, do we get these curves that I wrote down? So it's a little tricky to see, but I think we get curves like this. What would be a reasonable way to check to see if this is a curve here, a solution curve? It's a little bit worrying because if you look at the way this pattern goes right here, the question is, is it getting steeper or not? So I can always plug in another point and figure out what is y prime at that point that I highlighted right there. So what is y prime right here? So I could figure out y prime right there. And then, you know, if it's very similar to what this parabola, slope on the parabola is, then it's likely the solution. All right, we're not going to spend a huge amount of time uh, trying to basically guess solutions based on slope fields. So we're going to use slope fields. We can always check with them, but uh, it's just kind of a way to visualize what your solution space will look like, as opposed to visualizing exactly what a curve, what the solution is itself. So according to my notes, x equals 0, y equals 1, so 0, 1 is a singular point that does not fit in the rest of the pattern. Not really seeing why that's a singular point. Oop, I think, so if we did f a bunch of flow, uh, actual curves, we would get this shape in the lower left corner, all of which would be going through 0, 1 is that point they would all be traveling through. So basically what we have is if you dropped a leaf in right here, so if you drop the leaf in, it can't be on all these different curves at one time. It's supposed to be on one curve. So that's another way to get a singular point, is a point that's basically shared by lots of different flows. Question? Can you start in one flow and end in another flow because it goes through the same point? So if that happens, you've passed through a singular point if you're going to go from one flow to another, from one solution to another. Uh, the parabolas that have a different y-intercept other than 0, 1, those I believe are uh, just regular parabolas that there's only one solution. Like if you leaf dropped right here, it would go on this parabola. There would not be an infinite number of parabolas it would be on. So it's hard to see just looking at this, but we do have one singular point right there. So 0, 1 is a singular point. This example is also depicted on page 42 of the book, if you care to look. There we go. Do they say the same stuff I was saying? Yeah. Perfect. All right. So there's two types of singular points. One of them is, if we back up, you can think of... A whirlpool is not the best example of this because a whirlpool spirals in. Technically, a whirlpool would be a, a very different. It would look kind of similar, but the slopes would be sort of decreasing in its weird radial pattern. It would look kind of similar, uh, but this is not a whirlpool. This is more like a target or a successive bullseyes. So this type of singular point is the single point right in the middle that's not a circle, whereas the singular point that we just graphed is a different type, whereas it's on an infinite number of curves. So there could be either be a point that doesn't look like any of the other curves by itself, or there could be a point that's on lots of curves. So those are two different ways that you can have a singular point. And now we're going to get back to what feels way more like calculus and less like graphing. I will put a 
a flow question on your next quiz. Hint, hint. There may be a flow question on midterm or, and, and or a final. Is this a flow? Yeah, or direction field flow, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I think a direction field is what your book calls it. Yeah. So we're jumping into the next section. So the entire chapter, I think it's 6 through 10, is called Special Types of Differential Equations of First Order. That's what the entire uh, section is called. We're going to start out inseparable. So let's start out with the bad news. Almost all differential equations are unsolvable. Don't worry, it actually gets worse. If you look in general, almost all equations are not solvable. We just happen as professors to give you easy questions that you are solvable. So we pick from the arbitrarily large set of differential equations ones that are solvable and give them to you. Uh, this is true even in order one, where you just have a single derivative. Uh, and even if you find a solution, it may not work. <coughs> talking about so for example let's say you have you think ah here's the solution right here this y equals f of x this is a solution um, and you think it's a solution because when you plug it into your original however many derivatives there were and you always get zero uh, but domain of f is nothing, or the empty set. How useful is that solution? So you found something that satisfies your differential equation, however, the domain of this function is nothing. So in this case, you found something that solves the differential equation, but you can't actually plug in the x values in to figure out what y or y prime should be. So in this case, you have a solution differential equation, but the domain is nothing, or the empty set, so you can't plug any x values in to find any relationships between the x values and y values. So in this case, we cannot plug in any x values. So let's try an easy algebra problem and solve for x. So we don't even need calculus for an example where you can solve for x, yet it does not actually solve the original. So what's a good first step to solve for x here? Square both sides. Square both sides. So that's your first step. So square both sides. And I'm not going to write all over the original. So I'm going to rewrite it where I'm going to square things below. Because we're going to test our solution. We're going to come back and test it. All right, so foil the right side and do your best to solve for x. You should have a quadratic. So it should be. Uh, complete the square quadratic formula or if you're lucky you can factor it and solve. So I'll give you a minute for this.
83. Oh, man. This is going to be just ugly, right? Not too bad. Uh, it's so I just foil it just because I can create a class to X times K. Foil it? I like it. You mean complete the square? Wait, no, factor? Like factor. From that one I just got 3X minus 2 X minus 2. Let's see. So cons is good, X is good. We get negative 6x minus 2, negative 8. All right, so let's go with this version. So we got x equals 2, or x equals 1, no, 2 thirds? All right, so any questions on those? All right, how do you know if they're solutions or not? You just watch me do algebra, or you probably watch yourself do algebra. What what would it mean for this to be a solution? You plug it back in, it equals the equation still. Plug it back in. So do it, check. All right, 
how did that work out? Badly. Badly. So that's out. Maybe we'll get lucky and the second one will work. Let's try the second one. Probably won't work either. All right, so plug it in. to do anything to the right side or to the left side that negative one third is not going to be a square root of anything well not anything real at least all right so that's out too look we found two non solutions <laughs> all right so this can happen even in algebra world you can do a bunch of algebra you think you have it solved you go back and check and you all your solutions don't work. So this is what I mean by you can have you can quote find solutions. Look, we found two solutions that neither of which are solutions. So, so usually I don't give you problems that your algebra will lead you to non-solutions. Occasionally it happened in uh, logarithms. You would have two different x values, and one would work and one wouldn't. So that's the only thing I can think of the type of algebra problem I gave you where you used algebra, found solutions, and some of them didn't work. In this case, both of them didn't work. Um, well, I was just going to ask, so how is this like, possible? So, that's good. so where do we go wrong? Is well, I'm not asking where we went wrong, because uh, I'm pretty sure we did right. At least the algebra. So we did, there was something going on. How does this differ? I mean, obviously there's no square root, but think about what is allowed in that green box that's not allowed above. Oh, is it a plus or minus? Kind of, that's, that's one of the consequences of doing this. But when I square, what we really have, so what we originally had was basically uh, one function of x equals another function of x. The first thing we did was square both sides. So I agree if you start with two functions and they're equal and you square them, that'll also be equal. But what if you started here? Can you really say that f of x equals g of x? You kind of can. How can you say they're related? So one way to think about it, they're positives. Are, one of them is negative the other one. Or you could say that their absolute values are equal. There's two different ways to say that. So the problem is we started at the top line and then said, oh, well, we square them, they'll still be equal. Yes, but you eliminate the possibility that one could be negative. So that first step we did right there, squaring both sides, we got rid of the fact there was also, even though it wasn't written down, there was also the fact that x squared plus 4x minus 3 had to be greater than or equal to 0. And... 1 minus 2x also had to be greater than or equal to 0. Why is that? Yeah, the other side couldn't be negative. The left side can't be negative, so the right side can't be negative if they're going to be equal. So there was two more inequalities that were implicit, not explicit. And what happened if you look at both of these solutions we threw out, they're violating at least one of these two inequalities, if not both of them. So even though they satisfied this line right here, they didn't satisfy the original. So now, from now on, I guess we're going to have to like do the same question in three different ways to make sure that we're following all the rules. Well, I didn't redo anything. All I did was check. All I did was basically plug in. I checked my answers, and they were both non-answers. Oh, okay, I guess what I'm saying is instead of like us. You said that we could have either a positive or a negative equation, so we could have technically done the whole thing again, just having it negative and probably come up with different answers. I'm not sure I haven't done that. So, <coughs> you can't, these two inequalities that I wrote down have to be true if the line above it is true. So this is what I, this was given. 
was this first line right here. The consequence of that are these two inequalities are also have to be true. So by just writing down that equation with the square root equals that one minus two x, these two inequalities also had to be true. They weren't explicitly written down, but we know unless we're gonna use complex numbers, uh, the weight keeping it real means these two inequalities are also true. Uh, we <coughs> generally don't think of these two inequalities right away, which is why I recommend plug in your solutions to your original, see if they actually work. Because you might be very excited, oh look, I just did a bunch of algebra and calculus and x is two, whatever we got, or two thirds, but it turns out neither of those work. So you wanna check in your original. The techniques I'm gonna show you, how we solve differential equations is gonna be way harder to solve it than it is to check. We basically practiced all the checking we need. All you do is take you know, y equals f of x, take y prime, y double prime, plug everything in, see if it's equal. You're always going back to the original, so that's how you're gonna check. We spent an entire section checking. Now we're gonna spend the rest of the quarter solving. So you know how to check. So these non-solutions, we're gonna call them extraneous solutions. So these non-solutions, they're solutions, but not to the original differential equation. Now we're officially ready to start the regular uh, section six. So I think in your book it's called 6C. These are ODEs with separable variables. So these are ordinary differential equations, which are equations with no partial derivatives uh, and separable uh, variables. So if a first order ODE appears as this form, Q of X, Y, Q of X, Y, DY over DX equals P Oops, plus p of x, y equals zero. This would be exactly the same as I'm going to multiply everything by dx. So this could be written as q of x, y, dy <coughs> plus p of x, y, dx equals zero dx. But zero times dx is zero. So these are the exact same form for the same equation, or a different form for the same equation. So this is gonna be separable if there exists, so that's the backwards e, there exist functions f of x, and g of y such that such that our previous ODE can be written uh, is equivalent to dy dy plus fx dx equals zero. So another way to think about this, you can basically take the x portion of this coefficient and you can somehow move it over and you can take the y portion of this coefficient and somehow move it over. So usually what that means is 
it's a function of x times a function of y. So you basically divide by the whatever variable you don't want there. And this will uh, be more clear as we do some examples. How would we solve what is written down? <coughs> How do we get rid of dx and dy? Integrate. So we're going to solve by integrating. Integral g, I'm just going to write it as g dy plus integral f dx equals zero. So we're going to get some capital G, which would be the it'll be a function of y plus some um, capital f of x and your constant. You can write wherever you want. I'll write it on the right side. So this will be our solution right here. You got a function of y plus a function of x equals the constant. If you can solve all the way for y, you can write y as a function of x. If you can't, for example, an easy example would be uh, y squared plus x squared equals c. I can't explicitly solve all the way for y right here. So that would be a really easy solution that is not a function of x. There are plenty of other examples. So this will be a one parameter family of solutions, but we are expecting in a first degree, you should have a one parameter family of solutions. So we have five examples we're gonna solve now. I think I've written them in increasing order of difficulty. <coughs> so this first example, I'm going to already have separated. So it should be really easy to solve. So <coughs> that's right, plus in between x plus the y equals 0. So all you have to do is integrate, and you're pretty much done. I recommend when you write integral, don't write it on the original problem, because you've just literally changed the original problem if you write it like this. So I would not mark up the original problem that you're doing. Just leave it there, and then on your next line, write your integral. You can absolutely write the integral of zero, which we know is going to be a constant. That's another way to not forget that you're going to get a constant. And I can easily solve for y, but I don't there's really a point here. Anytime your power is odd, you can solve for y. But now, web work may ask you to type in y equals form, or they may just let you, uh, sometimes they want constant equals form, in which case this is the constant equals form right here. How would we check if we were right? Plug in the original. So even without solving for y, can you find y prime? take ddx and then so maybe we should just check the first one here so I'm going to check I'm taking an x derivative of this whole thing so we're going to get 2x plus 9y squared y prime equals 0 so we took an x derivative an implicit derivative here Y prime never appeared in my original. I have no idea how to plug this in. I could solve for Y prime. That's not too tricky. We got Y prime equals subtract our 2X divide by 9Y squared. So that's Y prime right there. How in the world do I plug this into the original? 
Well, in the original equation, we were using dy and dx to divide by dx. So y prime is dy over dx. So basically, I have to rearrange this so that I have dy over dx. So I'll just divide everything by dx, basically. So sometimes the original uh, form, you have to do a little work to get it basically writing in terms of y prime. So if I rewrite the original, I get 2x. <coughs> I'm going to divide everything by dx. So it's 2x plus 9y squared dy over dx equals, you could write 0 times 1 over dx, but that's just 0 right there. So really nothing to do on the right side. Now I can plug this in. So I got 2x plus 9y squared times negative 2 over 9y squared, hopefully equals 0. Oh, yeah, that'll... So let's just pretend that you didn't notice that. So 9's cancel, Y's cancel. All right, does that look like a solution? No. So uh, what to do here? So I know it's not a solution, so the question is, did I plug it in wrong? Did I... It's possible I wrote the equation down wrong, but I was pretty careful with that. Uh, so let's go right back somewhere. So I lost my x, so now I'll write that x in 2x. This is 2x, and now we see there's definitely a solution. All right, so <clears throat> you should be able to tell at the end of your checking whether or not you have a solution. So I just forgot to write the x in there, so that was my problem. But that's where you will encounter uh, whether your solution works or if it's not a solution. Because most likely as you're working, nobody's, unless you're working with somebody else and they're staring at you writing every single step, usually nobody's going to say, hey, you missed an X right there. You won't really know until you get down to check. And then it doesn't work when you plug it back in. So we'll do our next example. There's definitely restrictions on x and y. Let's see. And so I have to make sure 1 minus x squared is greater than or equal to 0. I can probably take care of this without graphing. So x squared has to be less than or equal to 1. So I think that's negative 1 to 1. x has to live in there. And then y. It can go from negative 5 to infinity. So we have to be a little careful about our domain here. You can't just plug any x value in. It's got to be a small x value. All right, how do we solve this? Integrate. So we're going to integrate this. It's already separated. We already have x's and y's grouped up, so there's really not much to do. What do I really have to do to integrate this? <coughs> so I could, the first one I could write as a half power. I'm not going to. So how do I solve the second, just, just the y antiderivative? <coughs> How quickly we forget calculus too. Basically use the power rule. There's a u sub if you want. It's kind of a trivial u sub. u equals 5 plus y. So du equals dx. So it's really not the u subs. There's not much going on. So in this one, you can probably just guess and check. I'm going to guess 5 plus y to the 3 halves multiply by the reciprocal, which is 2 thirds. So that's my guess right there. Just add one to the power, divide by that new power. How in the world do I integrate the x? Is it a 
I could try u sub, but any, if I use anything with x squared, I'm not going to have an x term. So I'm never going to find a du, basically. So that's out. It's a very good thing to try to go for first. But unfortunately, it won't work here. Is there some trig function? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's it. How do we do this with trig? Use a trig function from a cheat sheet. Trig substitution. Yeah. So your homework is make sure that you have chapter 8 from your calculus textbook on your cheat sheet. Or you know how to do everything from chapter 8. Chapter 8 was techniques of integration. Are you going to do the trig power rate? Go for it. Make sure you check, and so your derivative of what you say is antiderivative is this function right here. So you can do it that way, or I don't know how to do it the way you're talking about, but you can try it and see what you get. I don't. Th I think it's going to be super impossible. <laughs> All right. So your homework is integrate the left side, and I believe it's eight two or eight three in your calc textbook. No, this is homework on top of everything else.